good afternoon and good evening for everyone. And thank you for joining for this last panel where we have four speakers. Uh, two of them are with me here on stage and two, uh, the two artists, Yuji and Anna Hulachova, are joining us online. Uh, this panel is um, uh, focusing on the personal researches of, uh, uh, and working experiences of curators and artists as well. And through these personal experiences, we will see how they actually reflect and refer to each other. And the first speaker will be Juji from Shanghai. Uh, she was born in 1985 and she lives between Shanghai and Vienna. Uh, her interest is in the investigation on geography and geographical and historical narratives. And um, she is also associated this with field research. And she has a strong interest uh, on intervening in specific space with the body. Uh, she, uh, she was member, she participated in various exhibitions such as May You Live in Interesting Times at the last Venice Biennial in 2019. And she won the Hugo, Hugo Boss Asia Art for Emerging Asian Artists in 2017. Currently, she is working on the Cheese and Hale um, exhibition, which was postponed with a year. So hopefully it will open uh, in 2021, April. And thank you so much for joining us, Juji, and please uh, scare your, uh, share your screen with us. Thank you. Hi, hi, everyone. Uh, I am uh, I'm Yuji. Um, as, um, thank you very much for <laughs> introducing. Um, sorry, um, can you can you um, share the presentation which I sent to you yesterday? Because there is some problem of, the, of my computer that I have to just uh, um, change another one yes. for the Zoom. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that's better. So um, for, for this presentation, um, I choose two of my projects to share with you. Um, I will start with the early ones, which I um, um, made in the end of 2015. So um, on that year, I took the residence in Guangzhou Museum and stayed for two months um, that I can visit the north of Taipei, the mountain area, uh, which named Beitou, attempting to seek out trains of the sufferer which became to my project named Diary of Suffer Mining afterwards. Um, would you scroll down to next page, please? Thank you. <laughs> um, during my visit and the research of the Beitou village, I found a very interesting little book named The Small Sea Travel Diaries, written by Yu Yonghe in 17th century. Yu traveled to Taiwan following the explosion of the of Fuzhou gun power stores in 16, 1696 to mine suffer. Yu journeyed northwards to Tanshui and Beitou, where he brought suffer from local people for making the pure suffer. Um, this journey lasted about 10 months. As Yu was on a mission of collecting sulfur, his book is also referred to as the Sulfur Extraction Diaries. The book provides first-hand account of the most vivid historical records of that period. So, unlikely other other uh, primary um, records left by um, the early adventures and administrators in the 17th century. Yu's book reflected the multiple uh, characters of early Taiwan through the eyes of an adventurous and a passionate literate, uh, literacy. The book turns to be my guidebook um, of searching that area. Somehow, I think uh, my goal was, was similar with Yu's, 
to search for this nature material, the mind suffer to find a path to get closer to this area and try to understand the passion and power from not only the material but also from where it comes from. Sorry, I forget to <laughs> scroll down the page. <laughs> Hi, can you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now you. Um, sorry, I forget about the PPT. So now you can see the photo of that whole area. This is the Beito um, village, where is a um, special spot for travelers to go and visit to see the to see the supper, to see the uh, uh, sleeping uh, volcanoes. So, well, um, you know, volcanoes suffer um, the the. Um, the energies are strange and familiar terms in our knowledge system. Suffer is used in many things in our daily life. The suffer mind is, um, as you see, it's a tourist spot that is only opened for visits, and it's quite far away from the city. Um, scroll down, please. So um, I was attracted by the natural ecology formed from the surfer in Beto. However, the results from the research did not directly influence the um, expression form of my work. Actually, I give up displaying these uh, literatures in the final presentation uh, when I finish the residence, when I present my um, exhibitions in Taipei and a lot of images and audio materials from my um, field trip were not directly used in the work either. Screw down please. So I, I picked several pictures of the of the whole area where I um, do the research uh, and visit it but also these uh, these um, these images you see from the PPT is also the first um, is also the the the, um, the image from the video work of mine. So, at the end of the residence, could you please scroll down again? Okay. So at the end of the residence, I made a performance which can be um, easily described as I brought a piece of sculpture which looks like a stone covered with sulfur, concrete, and uh, soap. I, I bring it to the mountain to search for a mysterious area called Seven Star Point, which has been carefully protected by the local people until today and rarely exposed in travel blogs on the internet. Screw down, please. Okay. And next one, next page. Okay. So um, the journey was quite exhausting. However, when I finally reached the destination, I was deeply touched both by my own efforts um, and the amazing view I witnessed. At that time, Seven Star Point had no water actually uh, because, because that area hasn't, hasn't rained for nearly, I think, as I remember, more than one month and its bottom was covered in tender grass and, uh, and a scattering borders in the middle. I dragged the stone sculpture, with, which I created, all the way to the center of the borders and finished this performance. Next page. So the documentary of this performance became a main part of the video work called Bateau Stone. So this project diary of suffer mining plateau, I seem it as um, as a kind of um, first step as volume one, which means um, it is still ongoing. That I am willing to continue uh, the suffer the suffer mining research and performance, and doing performance, the researching project with sculpture and uh, installation um, to other places in the world. So, yeah, so this is the, this is the first project.
projects I showed I was show to you and uh, next page please okay so this this is um, this is a quite new project called Forager which I've just done um, at the end of last no in, in the middle of last November in Shanghai next page please So this project Forager comes up because the pandemic year. So um, here, please allow me to read a quite short paragraph of, of review of this exhibition, uh, which written by my friend, also curator, uh, Yuka, Yuan Fuka, because I think this, this short article writes um, accurate and objective view of this exhibition. Next page, please. Okay. So um, this was happened on 304 Avenue Apartments on Tonglen Road in Shanghai. It's temporarily being used as, a temp as, um, as an exhibition space. And here I continue my investigation into how the body the market and the redefined space by undertaking a field study of the remaining trains of the original apartment, a section of sculptures, furnitures, and, and green grass greens create a familiar living environment. Next page. The dining table tilts on the uneven floor while the half-drunk glasses of water, plaster cauliflowers, and the small clay figure sculptures about it, its surface are all in the process of disintegrating. Once decorated house plants are shoveled, half dead, an undrained bath tube filled with water stands tilt in the middle of the space. Next page. And next page, please. Thank you. There are two nearly life-size sculptures of male and female installed behind the lunch table, which have no feet, hands, or heads. Next page. However, Smaller concrete figures twist themselves around the freestanding length of rusty rebar, which seems to almost vibrate as you approach them. A vividly echoed an image of a child screen printed onto a piece of stainless steel. Next page, please. And next page, please. Yeah, that's that's the work. Through these shadowy green space of life, I whispered of forgotten history and a suspended time in this pandemic year. Next page, please. We have is it the last one? No, that, that this is the last one. Yeah. So as you see, this is, um, this is my current project. I have just finished a couple of months ago. So um, what I am trying, what I'm trying currently is that um, to, 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 to try to um, create some furniture um, with my sculpture together. And the interesting thing is this exhibition happened mm -hmm in a living area, it happened in a living building, which um, have a lot of neighborhoods lived around it. And when you walk into the space, you can feel a strong atmosphere of people's daily life, which I'm very interested in. So in this exhibition, as you see these images, um, if you can scroll back to to see again about these several pictures of this exhibition. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I try to um, let, let all the work to play together and try to bring people back to a living area, to a living situation when they come to see the show. And I, all of the work um, have been finished during this pandemic year, which um, is also, um, yeah, because, because of the COVID, I have to, I cannot travel and uh, all my projects delay that I have to uh, stay in my hometown, Shanghai. And all of these special experience and thinking during the whole year um, to comes up to these works and make this exhibition happen. So I choose these two projects of mine to share with you, which I think is quite makes sense about the, the title of this, of the talk tonight. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Juji, for this uh, uh, extremely interesting presentation of these two projects. And it's very interesting to see how you combine um, performance, installation, and your sculptures together. And also the interventions into the space, either it's into, it happens in the nature or in the city. Indeed, our next speaker, and thanks, Juji, again, our next speaker is very much interested in the urban setting. And uh, Pan Lu, who is here with us, she is an assistant professor at the Department of Chinese Culture at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And her research interest is focusing on cross-cultural analysis of various textual forms, including film, visual culture, art, and architecture. She published three, three monographs. Uh, what the first is Invisible Palimpsest, Memory, Space, and Modernity in Berlin and Shanghai. The second one, Aesthetizing Public Space, Street Visual Politics in East Asian Cities. And the last one, published in 2020, Imagination and Imaginarium, Re Remapping World War II, Monuments in Greater China. So thank you, Pan Lu, for joining us, and yours is the word. Thank you, Esther. Um, can, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, oh, okay. Um, yeah, thank you for introducing me and also thank you for um, <coughs> giving me the tour of this exhibition we're now uh, in. Uh, and I realized that actually many of the works here were also from uh, the 60s and 70s. And so uh, that's why I want to share with you, since I, we are in Hong Kong, uh, some uh, uh, research I have been doing about uh, the 70s uh, uh, alternative use magazine cultures. So shall we go to the first slide? Yes. And uh, yeah, uh, the, the magazine I'm going to talk about uh, is the name of the magazine is the 70s bi-weekly. It's an independent use magazine published throughout the entire uh, 70s in Hong Kong. And with uh, its extraordinarily large size um, of the magazine measuring like a poster, the, mag uh, the images on its cover and inner pages convey straightforward and bold messages about the main themes and the stance of the current issues. Using photo photograph, uh, photograph uh, uh, paintings, woodcut sketches, portraits, and other graphic genres, those images uh, crystallize the editor's interest in journalistic realism, pop art, folk art, minimalistic art, comics and collage art were also used to bring out highly political messages, often breaking social taboos of that time. Next, please. And the rise of uh, alternative culture theme uh, represented by the emergence of the 70s in Hong Kong can be traced back in the late uh, 60s and early 70s. After the uh, 1966 and 7 uh, social unrest, with the rapid economic growth in the following years, Hong Kong's local popular culture in Canton pop, film, and fashion industry boomed. 
As a result, a predominant narrative of the colonial rule's achievement to uh, promote progressive modernity serves to cover up many uh, instances um, um, injustice still in existence, such as the assumed uh, cultural inferiority of ethnic Chinese, the corruption of the police, and the unfair treatment of laboring masses. And meanwhile, since the late, uh, late 60s, waves of global student movements and the counterculture trends in Western Europe, America, and Japan had also reached Hong Kong. Against this background, the 70s created a new and vibrant countercultural uh, sphere that spoke against the establishment by criticizing the cultural and the social injustice under the British colonialism. Moreover, its dissatisfaction with the development of communism in China and its broad concerns of issues around the uh, Third War also defied uh, a, an exclusive definition of Hong Kong identity that either reduces local to Hong Kong only or overemphasizes its conformity to mainland. Uh, thus, the approach of this magazine complicated the relations between Hong Kong and its colonizer, the nation, imperialism, and the third world. Next. Um, in the context of Hong Kong, I find um, Michael Warner's concept of counterpublics, with which he emphasized on the agency of culture in the forms of art, public speaking, media, and performances, and people's use of culture to create a counterpublic space for themselves in the social world, particularly useful for the analysis of the 70s. And so in this talk, um, I will focus on uh, analyzing the uh, cover, both front and back images of the 70s, um, and its derivative, the 70s uh, use uh, vanguard, um, um, illustrate how it intermingles the aesthetics and tac tactical radicalism. And then I will concentrate on the icon icon iconic image of Chinese as official language movement of a clenched fist um, to, to show their uh, visual styles. So the mixture of woodcut, comic, pop art, and other forms of visual representations speak well to the hybrid nature and imaginative juxtaposition of political attitudes of the magazine, which absorb, absorb visual nutrition from both the right and the left, the bourgeois and the revolutionary. Next. So four major styles, um, namely, um, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, painted artworks, uh, photographs, comic uh, or caricatures, and collage, pop art, were found on the covers of 31 issue, issues published between 1970 and 1978. Contributing to a diverse outlook of the magazine, the four stars served their own purposes. Next. The first category was made up of paintings of a particular artist or artist groups. Painting was um, not an uncommon cover image for youth magazines at that time, yet the paintings that were used in the 70s still stood out with its care for choice. For example, what you can see in the slide is issue five, uses a woodcut painting by Taiwanese painter Liao Xiuping. Uh, the painting consists of symbols that resembles a new system of writing that combines everyday utilities and Chinese characters. And the cover of issue six shows a detail of an Indian Kangra painting of the mid 18th century in which women are seen of a group of male soldiers. And issue 15 re reprints the illustration of a Danish surrealist painter, Jorgen Bobek, of a scene from a legend. The magazines do not give an, an, any explanation of the choice of these paintings for the covers. The reader is invited to enter, as it were, a mysteries imagined and unreachable world. Next. In contrast, the second ca category, uh, photographs, um, Bangladesh uh, uh, special are most used uh, uh, as in journalistic, realistic representation that show stark violence uh, of the uh, Vietnamese war or police or social uh, crisis. Next. For example, the uh, entire iconic anti-Vietnamese war post and babies was used um, as the front and back covers of the issue seven. 
that shows the dead bodies of South Vietnamese women and children killed by the U.S. force in the infamous My Lai massacre on March, 19, uh, March um, 16, 1968 shot by the photographer uh, uh, Ronald L. Uh, Hallibel, the image became widely circulated in the U.S. media. The 70s editors might have picked up an image from Life magazine in 1969. The di di directness with, with which the loss of life and the human dignity in the war um, represents here is shocking, with the image of corpses lying on top of each other on the road overgrown with weed. The picture is also accompanied by the line Q and babies, A and babies, printed on, in red on top and bottom of the poster. The question that Mark, uh, Mike Wallace of CBS News asked of uh, Paul Midlow, an American soldier who participated in the um, atrocity. Next. Another photograph uh, motif that uh, was used frequently as a cover image of the 70s is police violence. The pig mouse as gas masks covered the entire face of the police, making them look at aliens devoid of humanity, reducing them to symbols of the state machine and its violence. While confrontations with police violence in student movements in the US and Europe in the late 1960s and early 60s, uh, 70s were a widely circulated theme for visual propaganda of the students, in colonial Hong Kong, the image of local police force, a mixture of British and Chinese officers, was rarely seen in previous youth magazines. Next. Yet, the violence did not come only from the establishment. The images show that radical forces also resorted to it uh, in their resistance to the government. The most striking image of this kind appeared in the uh, relaunch, the first issue of the 70s in 1978. In this image, the bronze statue of Queen Victoria in Victoria Park in Causeway Bay is splashed with red paint. A yellow garbage bin is thrown on the head of the statue, but with one side of the bin missing. Uh, and one can see that the paint also uh, streaking down from the queen's head too. On the statue's pedestal, six Chinese characters uh, are written in bold lines also with red paint, which is translated as down with slavery uh, education in English line uh, printed below the image. Next. The next category is comics and characters. Uh, they were either copied from external sources or drawn by members of the 70s. This form of cover images served largely the purpose of criticizing the establishment by using irony, sarcasm, and parody with a touch of humor. Sometimes the comics or characters were used to challenge the colonizers by breaking the taboo of making fun of the two most vital symbols of the British Empire, the Queen and the Union, uh, Union Jack. Um, this is uh, an image of Use uh, Vanguard's issue uh, 2, uh, uses a hand-drawn Union Jack as a front and back cover of the magazine. On the front, a naked little boy uh, has his back turned to the reader while peeing in front of Union Jack. Again, the witty use of taboo symbol, uh, symbolism subtly lingers between uh, a radical provocation and a mild joke or prank. Next. Other cases in this category target specifically social issues or persons and to, uh, in reaction to the police violence in the Defend Diaoyu uh, Island movement. On the cover of issue 22 in 1971, uh, Feng Yuan, uh, Feng Yuan it's a ca uh, character Medal of Honor for Great Service for uh, Superintendent Whitley ironically shows the police officer holding up a baton in a post ready to bring it down onto the students who are represented in the meadow by the nine raised hands in different gestures. Notably, not a single frightened face of the Crawford students is visible. A banner which reads, Peace demo on July the seventh, Chichi Ho Bing Shui is half buried between the police officer and the hands. The suspender of the medal is made of a red and white striped fabric, but blood can be seen dripping down from it. Next. 
The last category is pop art, which usually features collage, reproductions, and appropriations of ready-made images from mass and popular culture. As the editors of the 70s almost never offered titles of cover images or credited images that they, are, they used to uh, any source, it is sometimes difficult to tell whether they were original works, and if they were not, were, where they come, came from. Next, please. A cover uh, in issue 23 in 1971, which takes the typical pop art rendition of a line buster shots in a pattern. In this case, a two row of a two pictures each. The four pictures shows a face that is made up half of Richard Nixon and half of um, Isaac Sato, dead bolted together by the screws protruding from the neck. The face appears in four different color schemes and um, alternate between the pictures developed from film and film negative, a less than subtle, subtle way of making fun of the U.S.-Japanese aliens in the uh, Diaoyu Island dispute. The disregard of a copyright in both images and text from other sources, according to Wang Yandat, who is, was uh, as the major person in charge of the visual effect of the early issues of the 70s, set the basic tone of the magazine's visual style was a common practice in the editing process. Yet, this does not mean the editors relied on other ideas and lacked the innovative ideas of their own. Rather, the lack of proper copyright permission allowed the editors to make their own combinations of images. One noted, for example, the above-mentioned full-grid Nixon Sato image was originally in black and white. To make it look more pop, uh, one added the color. Another example of, um, next please, pop art is the appropriation of, yes, the appropriation um, of uh, the famous chairman receiving the Red Gods photograph, which first appeared in the People's Daily in 1966. In the newspaper textured black and white photograph, Mao is seen in a close-up waving uh, his right hand. Um, in the 70s remaking, Mao's image is set off by a scarlet background while a line reading the black hand of the Chinese revolution is printed on his sleeve. Be it borrowing or innovating, the 70s pop art co covers um, aimed at blurring the boundary between the political and the cultural icons, the Western China, high and the low, creating a strong visual impact through uh, various compositions and a blend of genres of images. Next, please. And the following discussion is dedicated to the clinched fist, uh, a symbol of the movement of Chinese as official language movement, which campaigned for the adop adoption of Chinese language as the official language of British Hong Kong in 1970 to 1971. As the only iconic image designed and widely used in 70s members in social activism, the fist icon revealed an interesting conjunction between the inference from the U.S. civil rights movement and the local Hong Kong youth political campaign and the ideological choice in the discourse of the movement. Designed again by Wang Yan Duck, a uh, right hand raised the fist with eight Chinese characters that reads Chinese as official language on the wrist can be found more frequently, um, uh, well, in, in different forms on demonstration uh, placards, on t-shirts, as an illustrative element of the 70s magazine. Next, please. Yeah, arguably, Hong Kong version of the clinched fist belonged to the second uh, fist wave in the new left movement uh, of the 1960s in the West. Wong admitted that his design was largely inspired by the Black Panther Pan uh, Party fist logo, and he was particularly attracted to the power of the, uh, the icon uh, represented. The Chinese language uh, movement fist, to my eye, is actually identical with the fist of the Harvard strike, in which the students uh, in Cambridge protested in Harvard's role in the uh, Vietnam War. The first fist appeared on the cover of uh, April 22nd to May 9th issue of the strike specials of the Old, Old Mo, an underground new, uh, left newspaper based in Boston between 1968 and 1970. 
Later, it also appeared on the cover of April 1969 issue of Harvard Alumni Bulletin, uh, what I call the uh, HAB. The shape of the icon, as well as the position of the figures and fingers and the red color of the Harvard Strike Fist, were basically identical with those of the Hong Kong Fist. Page 9 of the HAB issue also contains an illustration with a bunch of uh, raised fists with longer arms. Exactly the same ex uh, illustration was reproduced on page 4 of the 16th issue of the 70s in 1970, along with an interview with action committee members of the Chinese as official language movement. In the context of Hong Kong, the movement per se did expected to win support from local working class. However, there was also no particular implication of a Marxist class uh, solidarity in the Red Fist. Rather, the solidarity was sought across all classes of people whose mother language is Chinese. The major symbolic take of the fist, in other words, was essentially anti-colonial. Next, please. To sum up, the aesthetic um, co counterpublic of the 70s was formed through two paths. First, the magazine's aesthetic was not only influenced as many uh, uh, May, many, may be assumed uh, by the art of China or Chinese speaking word, but also closely re related to the visual style of the Western New Left, uh, New Left independent and radical publishing. In comparison with other magazines in Hong Kong, it can be said that the aesthetics of this magazine is by no means nationalistic, but neither it is entirely Western centric. And secondly, the 70s does not have a fixed artist to act as a visual designer. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, although a significant number of the covers and interiors of uh, the 70s were designed by Wang Yuntat, the overall vision of the magazine was still shaped collectively. Thus, the magazine exhibits a hybrid and highly decentralized visual style. The 70s disregard for copyright also makes the magazine's visual representation a mixture of originality, recreation, and reproduction. This approach, which I call visual guerrilla, is itself a form of counterpublic action, which opposes the author's sole hegemony over visual reproduction, uh, production, and, and in turn serves as a politically descending tactic by the magazine in the 70s Hong Kong. That's all for my talk, thank you. Thank you, Pan Lu, for this uh, presentation. It's extremely interesting how it connects with uh, Georgie's last project uh, in Shanghai last year, because in, in a way, both of them are interested in the realm of the city, on the urban scenery, and how various visual forms are present in it. In one hand, artists like Juji create exhibition in an intimate uh, space. And on the other hand, Pan Lu's research, which goes back into the 70s, shows how everyday visual material is connected in one hand to the art, to, to the art because we saw, for example, the, the, some of the posters uh, from pop art, which refers to Andy Warhol, and how actually all of them are just bombarding us as a public. And actually, it's a big question how we digest all of this visual material in whatever decades we are living in. So the next, thank you. The next speaker will be Anna Hulachova. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have to say that she is a mother of a one-year-old uh, baby, so she might need to switch off for a moment. And we are perfectly fine with it. In that case, we will just go to our next speaker. Uh, so um, if not, everything will go smooth um, as it might happen. So she was born in, eight, in 1984, uh, just a year older than Judy uh, in uh, back then Czechoslovakia. Now she lives uh, in a small village near to Prague. She studied at the Bac Academy of Fine Arts in Prague, and she, her works are mainly uh, handcrafted sculptural works, figurative. Sometimes it is one piece, but very often it, they become a part of an installation, as we are going to see it later, where various cultural works are present together. 
and she combines fine art with applied and folk art, as we will see. She was, uh, she, uh, she was present in numerous international exhibitions last year at Centre Pompidou in Paris and um, uh, Montpellier Contemporary uh, in 2018, Foundation Louis Vuitton in Paris. So um, thank you so much, Anna, for accepting the invitation. And the word is yours. Thank you also for invitation. So I will start with uh, my with presentation, if you will uh, show the PDF. Thank you. So I did uh, a selection of installation uh, in which uh, the figures cooperate with uh, household appliances or uh, domestic technologies with uh, natural elements together, really. And especially this work, uh, the title is uh, The Next Shift. And uh, this is a current solo show at uh, Pedro Serra uh, in Lisbon, uh, which is currently closed. So I have uh, included it here. So uh, these sculptures, uh, despite uh, their domestic context, uh, represent uh, themes uh, connected to industrialization, such as factory labor or uh, mechanical reproduction or technological progress, or something like that. And, so, uh, and also uh, the series of sculptures of women are kind of memorial to women who, from a long stay in uh, the household, have uh, gone uh, insane uh, and lost all personal freedom. So I wonder to what uh, extent technology is a helper and to what extent it co-creates uh, our characteristics and uh, predetermines our roles. So also there are some details, but uh, not seen in this, uh, in this picture, but uh, there are also some shadows cast under each of five figures are related to the masculine attributes that are the pedestals of these statues. But the statues are also attached to them as a silent commentary on traditional gender role uh, division within the family nucleus, so trapped in daily life. So uh, next, next please, next page. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this this piece, this work uh, installation, uh, I have. Uh, title for that Ascension Mark I. Um, the idea is based on technology uh, versus spirituality and women's and men's roles in today's industrial world. And uh, this is reflected in their um, cut off faces, which are masks made of uh, digital print uh, of household appliances. Uh, in this case, uh, a razor and an iron, so scroll, scroll down, uh, next page. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, they can represent both gender roles and their anonymous characters. And uh, also a session means uh, to reach uh, or touch heaven, also the experience of ecstasy, the incorporeal non-physical essence of being, uh, or define gravity and the upward reaching gestures of uh, the busts resemble uh, Baroque or Gothic uh, sacral, uh, sculpture, sculptures, mm -hmm. which can be found in uh, churches. And also Mark Van is uh, from a technological dictionary, and it means in this case a serial mark or product number. Uh, next page, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is a second segment of the installation, uh, like detail view, uh, is composed of two hands, uh, which surface raises, and their soles or interiors uh, emit fragile and uh, lightweight substances such as uh, foam or flowers, um, and 
the bubbling flow from the hand symbolizes gravity and the downward stream of bubbles uh, follows the shape of the cupped hands. Uh, also, next please. Uh, yeah, there is also, I want to say, uh, there is also a hidden surrealistic message in uh, the disintegrating basis of Torzos. Uh, one calls out, uh, help me please, and the other one responds, but you are a fish. So these two figures appear to be uh, engaged in a metaphysical conversation by which also has its own approaching individuality. Um, next, next page, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and this is uh, this, yeah. I have, this this work was uh, also part of Achetreno, where the installation worked before, and uh, I call it return from the mission. Uh, the relief of mm, the astronaut and cosmonaut was inspired by uh, an anonymous uh, freeze from uh, the Soviet era in uh, the metro in Prague. And the relief uh, shows two astronauts uh, ceremoniously uh, returning from a mission in space. And I borrowed their gestures uh, and dystopically exchanged the uh, astronauts for beekeepers. Because like uh, space, uh, the agriculture landscape is uh, gradually becoming in an inhospitable sci-fi environment. Next, please. Uh, yep. Yeah. This installation was shown on uh, Baltic Terminal, and uh, I um, call it, uh, the title is Underboard Upside Down. It's a kind of representation of the spiritual world uh, underground as uh, the other side of the world um, from which objects and technology come. Uh, which eventually becomes commonly used in our home. And uh, next, please. Oh, that will be also. And yeah, around around the pool, uh, a group of figures uh, carry household appliances. Uh, kettle, for example, kettle. Uh, there is yeah, um, toaster, mixer, etc. And uh, these uh, everyday objects replace uh, traditional offerings, food and drink, without satisfying an appetite. And with this uh, procession resembles uh, a pagan ritual. So, and next one, next, next please. Yeah, uh, like, yeah, this is a detail. Of, so this is like a, like a, a shrine in the center where lying uh, on an upturned swimming pool. Uh, Dionysus holds uh, a bunch of grapes and uh, foam spring from his bolo, <laughs> hollow belly uh, like uh, an eternally starving, uh, dissatisfied customer uh, decide to saturate uh, the soul of society and, uh, in the background and an enlarged digestive tract emerges like a, a mythical snake. Like. Um, yeah, then next, please. Thank you. Uh, this is my um, work title, Macro in Micro. And uh, this installation was uh, composed uh, of uh, sculptures and sculpture groups responding to the bites like uh, different words and the effort uh, to uh, interconnect them. 
uh, for example, hierarchy versus social harmony, utopian ideas versus dystopian moods, uh, or the industrial world connected with the natural. And there is some, yeah, next picture, next slide, page, please, thank you. This is uh, uh, like we tell you the sculpture sculpture group represents human societies and inside the collective is a cavity inhabited by bees that uh, have exposed honeycombs and uh, like a micro it will be like a micro um, society inside uh, macro society so it will be I don't know the detail. It's better to show the next next page. There is a better seen this detail. Detail, for example. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I I work with we sometimes as uh, co co creators of matter, uh, like souls inside statues, and uh, I'm inspired by ancient ancient Greek uh, legions which uh, believe that uh, bees uh, or bee just uh, is a symbol of uh, immortality and eternity so because because uh, domestication uh, like before domestication uh, bees built honeycombs and they lived uh, in the cavities of uh, <coughs> dead bodies so likewise, uh, other ancient culture also associated bees with immortality or of the spirit and uh, like uh, something like uh, bees that emerged from the cavities uh, of the bodies were seen as uh, hosts rising back up uh, from the kingdom of the dead. So this is why. I like this uh, process and I like work with bees in uh, sculptures, like so inside them. Mm. I think this should be this should be all for me on my side. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna, for the presentation. Uh, we enjoyed it very much and uh, it's um, also interesting how you talk about your works because actually you are also an activist uh, uh, against the agricultural reforms which are going through, which are happening in, in Czech Republic and how they actually are present in, in your works in, in a very uh, subtle way. Thank you very much for the presentation and for your talk. And now we go to our last uh, panelist, uh, the curator of this webinar, Wang Weiwei. Thank you so much uh, for today. She is curator uh, of exhibitions and collections at CHET in um, Hong Kong. And prior to that, from 2010 to 2017, she was curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Shanghai. Uh, in 2017, she was a in curator in residence program at the Kwangdu Museum of Fine Art in Taiwan. And, in, um, and then she was also co-curator at the 12th Shanghai Biennial and awarded as individual fellowship by Asian Cultural Council Hong Kong in 2018. Because she, has, she works now at CHET, she has been focusing uh, on textile artists uh, recently, so her interest uh, is also overlapping about what Pili talked in the first panel, Marian Varbanov. And now we are going to hear um, some of her projects. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I, can I control the, okay. Thank you, Ista. Um, thank you very much for having me as a speaker and uh, I'm the last one and uh, thank you very much for the patience. Um, so today I would like to share a bit about uh, my current curatorial practices which are focusing on a series of discussion based on East Asian context but through a uh, lens of textile. 
But before that, I would like to give a very short introduction about CHAT and what we are doing now, since our institution is still quite young and uh, uh, maybe some of you are still not very familiar with us. Um, so um, CHAT is located in a renovated cotton spinning mill. Although textile is one of our important um, DNA, but uh, CHAT is not a textile museum but an art center to explore what textile can do in art, design, and our daily lives. So for us, textile is more like an agent which can link the heritage, design, and contemporary art. So we encourage artists, designers, and all different creators to consider textile as a creative medium which can transcend and break through the inherent fear and inspire the alternative imagination. At the same time, we engage the visitors, especially the Hong Kong uh, communities, in offering the opportunities for learning Hong Kong's textile industrial past, as well as creating multiple experiences of textile in uh, art, design, and cultural context. If we, we take a few observations on textile as a subject, uh, we can review that a lot of research and uh, discussion can be carried out around textile. Uh, what inspired me the most is that through the lens of textile and its cultural context, we will be able to imagine and comprehend the landscape and the relationship among ourselves and others uh, from microscopic and macroscopic levels. So I would like to go a little bit further to analyze how we interweave um, textile with uh, contemporary art, design, and daily life. So I will take a, a talk a bit about the project I'm curating now um, together with my colleague Sunny Chen in chat. Um, we are curating a series of um, projects which set the vision on the survival and interrelationships of individuals under the complexity of East Asia, using personal experiences as an approach to explore multiple possibilities of mutual influences between individual act actions, social environment, and the shaping of the global configurations. In this project, we pay attention to the coexistence of shared and paradoxical imageries in ideological and cultural exchanges across the region. At the same time, the such coexistence is parallel with uh, disagreements that is overlap and deepen with new contradictions. Personal and collective uh, relationships based on mutual um, dependence are often mixed with uh, contempt and attention that contours a complicated image of East Asia. We attempt to explore such relationships through the growing uh, creative practice informed by textile, using curating as an active agent for critical um, investigation, reflection, and interpretations. So the series of projects contain exhibitions, online and offline forums, and publications. Uh, the exhibitions are divided into two parts. The first one sets out the survey how the historical, social, and ideological landscape of East Asia is received and shaped by design, and the cultural tensions connected with different individual and collective forces. The second chapter is more leaning to contemporary art. We are, we are inviting uh, contemporary artists, designers who are active in East Asia region who or take East Asia as their focus of research and creative um, direction. So we encourage them to uh, conduct different forms of collaborative research, survey, or uh, creation, and present multiple uh, dimensions of understanding East Asia through exchange and interactions. So I would like to give you a little bit preview about some artists we are working together uh, to um, uh, develop their projects. The first one is Park Ji-hee. Uh, she is a Korean artist. Um, since uh, 2014, 
Park Ji-hee has been working on analyzing modern buildings of old cities in terms of anthropology, reconstructing them through DIY experiments. So for our project, she's going to develop a project based on the concept of cooperation with microorganisms. As we experience that microorganisms have always had a close relationship with humans, Recently, uh, microorganisms are also used as a sustainable method in the textile dining um, industry. So she's going to create the works using pigments created in uh, collaborations with the fungi obtained from the modern textile factory buildings through DIY buyer experiments. So she will collect uh, um, organic objects from the old factory buildings of Hyeongsan Textile which is established during Japanese colonial period and is one of the most symbolic uh, factory companies in uh, a factory uh, fi fabric industry in Korea. And she will find various types of fungi and select the ones that could be used as pigments and then uh, cultivate them to create pigments. And that also she's going to collect uh, microorganisms in other colonial buildings of each country in Asia to develop works with them or talk about dyeing industrial complex in each country using indigo color cultured from microorganisms. Through this kind of process, she is questioning the history about the country of origin or issues about traditions that people are sensitive and always argued about. Uh, the next artist is Horian, who is from Singapore. Uh, he is also participating in our uh, CHAT 2021 Artists in Residence project. So Horian is conducting a series of research about the textile industry in Hong Kong and Pearl River Delta. As we know that um, textile industry was a key player in Hong Kong's industrial past and build up a very strong connection with the development of Canton region back to early 80s to 90s. So he's going to investigate the workers' situation in the post-industrial turn of capitalism as well as the uh, displacement of Hong Kong's manufacturing based by the financialization of its economy. Uh, for example, how the labor process changed with the industri uh, industrial of uh, new uh, ma machinery alongside the vertical uh, integration of the textile industry and the rise of the um, manager class that would later become a key role for uh, Hong Kong's post-industrial post uh, turn towards financialization. Also, we have a Chinese artist, Chen Yiyun, who is based uh, in Shanghai. Uh, she is also a designer who is uh, using uh, critical design and speculative design as his creation language. The theme of Chen Yiyun's creation in recent years is about useless body or say incorrect body. She is discussing uh, about the relationship between the body and individual uh, value. Useless body refers to the body that is considered to be unable to produce value in today's society. So she criticized that the, the individual value is dominated by the body. She expands the use of the useless body in the project through critical design and speculative design. Uh, attempt to question this value judgment of the body. And also the project is extended to the content of the capitalism system and the labor issue. So uh, for the project in chat, her focus is more on the pregnant woman or uh, menstruating woman, and etc., etc., considering that uh, you know, uh, we have a very long and controversial relation between the female labor and the textile industry. Also, the, the focus is on women's unique physical state, which traditionally being uh, considered as lack of labor. 
So the origin of this project is from the confusion that she and the woman around her experienced and observed when they entered the childbearing age. Last not but least, uh, we have artist Lu Yang. She is a very active artist uh, using video um, and animation as a, a creation method. Uh, in Lu Yang's work, well, we can always see that she is fascinating about the human body and the neurology, and her work bridged the scientific and the technology technological with aesthetic drawn from popular youth culture, creating new vision of China in the face of modernity. But this time she is collaborating with a Japanese embroidery master to create a series of installation works using very classical embroidery technique. The embroidery master is using very special fiber uh, material and old technique but actually helping Lu Yang to explore a new visual language in her creation and adding a strong sense of time and handwork. And on the other hand, the concept of Lu Yang's works are also provoke uh, the upgrade of this old embroidery traditions. And the interesting thing is actually this project was initiated from the uh, embroidery uh, master side. So we can see that uh, whether from uh, figurative or um, abstract, uh, metaphorical or symbolical ways, we always can find a lot of inspiration from te textile. But of course, it requires us to really read into objects, uh, open our eyes, and then we will be able to see those invisible threads that are weaving everything together. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Bebe, for this very interesting presentation. And uh, now we open up the section for the public. So if you have any question, just please type into the chat box. In the meantime, I will start my questions to each of you. So um, I will start with you, seeing that we just saw some of the works which are presented in your collection. And you as a curator, when you approach an artist that you want to uh, commission a, uh, a work in a chat, how do you, how this collaboration happens? You as a curator are closely working with the artist itself. Can you tell them how do you choose the artist? Uh, are they already in some ways connected with textile art? Can you say a few words about that? Um, thank you for the question. Well. I think um, the, the curators have to be very flexible and have to be uh, totally open mind, especially um, as a curator who need to um, select the artists and helping them to also open their mind to uh, collaborate or using uh, textile as an open concept for their artworks. Sometimes I feel myself as a matchmaker and also an agent uh, in between um, to, to help these artists find a right co collaborators to realize the works. And also, um, I'm also very much enjoying um, the discussion, communication with artists when we talk about textile. Uh, a lot of time actually I learned from them. They are also helping me to open my mind to understand about textile. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So my next, my next question is uh, for Anna. Uh, we saw your installations and your sculptural works, but uh, what is interesting that usually you leave the works uh, uncolored. They remain in their natural color. Can you say a few words about how do you relate yourself to the color? Why do you, why you don't use it or uh, sometimes we can see that uh, there is a tapestry which is colored, so that adds a very vivid um, impression to the whole installation. How, 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 how does it work for you? Um, yeah, um, I like uh, the color of material, concrete uh, itself. Uh, so for, I don't know, I like the rawness and brutality, and it also relates uh, with uh, aesthetic 
of Soviet uh, brutalism or normalization, and also uh, this is also a very strong symbolic language it uses, uh, and also as well as the rough material such as concrete is also beautiful color itself. Also, concrete is uh, everywhere. I, I love I love this material like very symbolic. It's also very contro eco controversial material. Uh, on the other hand, but uh, I like that. I, I would say that uh, if it's everywhere and if is it in all sectors that uh, and such as a commonplace mm, material, and uh, it's also for me becoming a folk construction material for modern men, and uh, I like I like. Uh, uh, leaf material itself, and uh, I prefer to combine uh, it with uh, other colored or otherwise uh, contrasting materials. So usually, I like their interconnection of, uh, with them. It's also very symbolic, not only for not only because materials, but also thematically. And uh, I like, for example, fragile surreal uh, surreal surreal or nature elements uh, which I like uh, to combine uh, with uh, other materials like like uh, and uh, like like I, I mean combined with other materials like uh, surreal surreal or Soviet uh, surreal with Soviet Soviet uh, Soviet aesthetic or futuristic aesthetic and uh, also I can say the brutal concrete can be uh, a great base uh, and in combination with other fragile and surreal materials uh, and teams produce a very refreshing contrast. So, and also you asked me about, uh, about uh, background of color for the background of sculptures uh, that in, for example, uh, work Ascension Mark I, uh, in a work in this installation, the background of white concrete uh, torsos is blue turkeys, uh, referring to decay of the sky. And uh, also, this is also very symbolic. And uh, also, for example, uh, in the case of yellow, yellow background macro and in micro installation uh, is related to monoculture agriculture here, uh, where predominantly yellow rapeseed plants are grown and which needs a lot of spring chemistry. So these yellow fields are very typical in our country. Yellow fields are all around and uh, at the same time dangerous, not only for bees, but also for us. And this was also very symbolic using of this, this color. So uh, for me, color it's, uh, I, 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 love, I love color itself, material like concrete, but, but uh, this is also why, the, why uh, concrete is, the color of concrete, concrete is too strong with combination with other materials and colors. Like Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and Pan Lu, so we had a very interesting conversation the other day uh, between uh, the difference of art history and visual studies. Mm -hmm. And you are into visual studies. And it's also interesting to see how you study the material you are working with. And uh, for example, you divide the, 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 the visual material into styles or subject matter, which I found very similar because that is something what we do in uh, art history as well. So can you say a bit about the differences in methods of working between visual studies and art history? Mm. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, well, I, I think because, for example, this research project, uh, the, the uh, talk I just gave is only uh, Part of my research project on the magazine, 
So um, I think so far, um, well, well, there are uh, many other discussions about the mag, not many, but the discussions about the magazine. Uh, but they are not really connecting the visual uh, aspect with its content. So, so sometimes uh, people were focusing only on the content, <laughs> and sometimes people only focus maybe on uh, the visual. But I, I really want to combine both, and, and this is the first thing. Um, but also from the art, histor art historian's perspective, maybe, um, for example, uh, the magazine covers, which fall usually under the idea of design, <laughs> does not really come into uh, many of their interests because uh, design is usually seen as another category or is related more to commercial, you know, word and things. So art history tend to not to look at them. And uh, so um, for me, like uh, um, uh, my studies in visual culture and, and cultural studies in general, general, I, I think I, I really, um, in the first place, uh, I want to look at uh, visual, not, not only look at its visual content, but also political. So I want to merge too. But on the other hand, I also want to look for different kinds of materials uh, or texts that are ignored or marginalized or neglected by art history. So that's uh, basically what I was trying to do, yeah. Thank you, yeah. thank you. And the next question is from, for, to Juji. Um, it's interesting that you studied sculpture at the Academy of Fine Arts in Shanghai. And then you are also practicing uh, performance and installation, so you went into the other mediums. And sometimes you are combining them, as we saw at, your, at the project you presented. Um, can you say a few words, how do you approach these different mediums? Are they different realms for you? Or for you, it's actually one realm together? And if it's one realm, then how do you define them? Because at the end, they are still uh, different uh, visual expressions? Um, I think, um, let me think how to say, well, just as you introduced, that like, I study sculpture. So um, actually in, in my college, I have this kind of uh, traditional uh, experience to, to practice how to sculpt in uh, for five years. And afterwards, I also finished my PhD uh, in sculpture department. So uh, I, I would say um, sculpture is the, is the key media of my art practice. But, but meanwhile, um, as I, just as I introduce, uh, just I do my presentation today that uh, the two projects I picked, um, it's obviously uh, combined with a lot of different media. Uh, but uh, as I see, um, they all started from the sculpture, or sculpture tends to be the material, or tends to be the uh, connection in between different media, and sometimes sculpture tends to be the uh, kind of objects I, I used in my performance, just like the one I did in Beitou, the, um, the, the Stafford Mining um, Diaries, um, the sculpture I, I bring to the mountain during my performance was was the one I uh, created during my residence in, 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 in the residence. So, um, and also um, it was interesting that uh, it's a performance happened over there, but without any audience actually. I did it alone, um, only me and the sculpture and another filmmaker, uh, no any audience to see. So. Uh, it's it's a performance without any audience, and after after the performance, I transfer this into a video. So all of the art, all of the audience, they see through the video, and that media just transferred again. So this is what I I interested to do, um, and also like like the second uh, project I presented. Um, if you remember, there were two uh, silk screen printing image on a stainless uh, 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 um, 
um, stainless metal. So, um, so sometimes I also like to use images to, 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 to make it work with other of my sculptures and the installation together. together. But meanwhile, uh, these images is a kind of reflection uh, to my um, working process or sometimes to my action, like the images coming from my performance or something like that. So for me, it's a kind of uh, like, you know, it's like a re recycling system or, or, or I don't know. So I just try to play with this media, with, with the body, with, the, with, the, with my body and also the body I created. Um, yes, that's, <laughs> I hope it answers your questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Really interesting. Um, seeing that we have still uh, seven minutes of time and, uh, um, and, and, and the last panel is about how these different practices revert to each other and we have two sculptures, one from China and the other from Czech Republic and both of you tend to work with concrete and the, um, the sculptures uh, you have the uh, it's, it's, it's a body fragmented or, or partial. So can, you, can we finish this panel by uh, how, Anna, you see Judy's works? Um, <laughs> and then if we can hear Judy, how she reflects or what she thinks about when seeing Anna's works. Can you start, Anna? Um, ah, okay, <laughs> sorry. I uh, think Anna has. Anna's back. Okay. She, she, okay. So, can Gigi start first, please? Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, I think, I think it's very. Anna, uh, firstly, I would say very, very nice to meet you over the screen. So, um, um, I, I'm, I'm super interested about your work, actually. Uh, but I think it's very limited time to know about your art practice uh, from this presentation. But I think um, it's already start. So um, actually, I yeah, I am very well. Yeah, being being also sculptor, I'm I'm of course very interested about the techniques <laughs> of how you how you mix all of these different different materials in sculptures and I'm also interested about uh, um, the form the form of your uh, figurative sculpture that because you mentioned about uh, 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 you mentioned about uh, uh, um, church right in the relics so um, um, yeah um, that's <laughs> Yeah, that's my uh, yeah, that's my um, rough idea after this presentation. Yeah, and oh, and one thing uh, we we didn't talk about before because uh, I feel a very vivid uh, humor from your sculpture, which is which which I don't have. So <laughs> I, and this is also what I feel. I I think it's a very strong uh, uh, um, touch by your work. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm also, uh, I just, just <laughs> I want to say that I'm also your big fan, that, that uh, oh. your favorite artist also, uh, this is, very, this is nice to hear from your side that you like. Thank you. Uh, my uh, uh, work and uh, also for, for me uh, that I, uh, when I saw uh, your, your, your works, that uh, also I love, I love the, also that you work with with uh, concrete also with this brutal. That this is very something something which is not only not only about the material 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 issue, but also uh, there is also environmental environment and also this is this is every time very close to me and I I love this approach and I really really love that and uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it's very nice seeing interacting you. And um, now I think we are almost out of time. So thank you for everyone uh, watching at us today.
um, later on this will be also on WeChat platform, so it will be available um, in various um, websites and platforms. And thank you for everyone's attention throughout the day, and uh, sorry and apologies for the technical um, issues. And um, yeah, have a nice weekend. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>